Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Thursday, February 18th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. The Los Angeles musician who helped design the microphones on the Perseverance rover that will hopefully give us our first ever audio recordings of Mars. Can a 19th century etiquette book make Twitter bearable? And what some of the top websites looked like on this day in 2011. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. By the time you hear this, the Perseverance rover should have landed safely on Mars. Assuming it survives the so-called seven minutes of terror, the nail-biting period during which the rover executes an incredibly complex entry, descent, and landing, or EDL. Now, despite its landing site being the challenging terrain of the Jezero Crater, this EDL should look much the same as the Curiosity rover's landing back in 2012. What will be different, however, is how it will sound, or rather what we Earthlings will be able to hear. Because Perseverance is decked out with two high-tech microphones which will be able to record sounds of the descent as well as throughout the rover's mission. If it works, it will be the first time we've ever been able to hear recordings of audio on Mars. Now, you won't have heard them during the live stream this afternoon. It'll take a few days before we have video and audio that Perseverance hopefully records. But if and when we do have that audio, you can thank, in part, a space-obsessed musician from Los Angeles. Jason Achilles Mizellis is a rock musician, composer, and audio engineer with a lifelong passion for space. And that passion has led him to cross paths with folks who work at NASA here and there, despite him having no professional background in rocket science. It was when he was having drinks with a friend of his from NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab in 2016 discussing the Curiosity rover that Mazellus first questioned whether it would be possible to put a microphone on the next rover so we could actually hear what Mars sounds like. Though he was intrigued, his NASA friend told him that the payload decisions for the next rover had pretty much already been decided, and when you're going all the way to Mars, every extra ounce means more fuel and energy. But Mazellus decided to try to put together a pitch anyways, just in case. Quoting Wired, He focused on reasons NASA might consider a mic on Perseverance. Public outreach potential, for one, giving space science fans something new to latch onto. And it could be a diagnostic tool for the rover, even an early warning system for mechanical faults. We take for granted how often sound is used in our latent perceptions, he says. The first time you can tell when your car or your refrigerator is acting up is when you hear something wonky. He then tackled the engineering challenges. The microphone would need to survive the launch and the seven-month journey to Mars, along with the 120-degree heat swings on the planet itself. Mazellus studied how the analog-to-digital converter should be designed, what sort of sensitivity the device should possess, which parts should be mounted on the outside of the vehicle, and which could be protected inside, what sort of testing and calibrations would be needed, how the final recordings would need to be processed, end quote. But then, he was told that NASA had indeed decided to go forward with incorporating a microphone on the rover with basically their own plan. He was excited it was happening, but still wanted to be involved and get his own pitch on the table. As Wired puts it, NASA isn't really in the business of accepting random proposals from gig musicians, no matter how passionate they may be about space or how much they may know about audio engineering. They have their own network and resources for these things. But Mazellus did everything right with his pitch. Quoting again, he included white papers he'd written on the microphone's design, calibrating the final product, and post-processing the raw data files. He'd even hired an acoustical science engineer named Cesar Garcia to help hone the pitch. End quote. And all that work paid off. Mazellus and Garcia ended up being hired as contractors by NASA to help with the design of two separate mics. One would be attached to something called the SuperCam and mostly be used for geological experiments. And then, quoting again, the entry, descent, and landing microphone would be oriented toward capturing sounds for a broader audience than the science oriented SuperCam mic. Though official specifications for the microphone stipulated only that the device last through the rover's journey to the planet, it could well remain functional long into the mission, a planned two years. Mars probes can last long beyond their expected lifespan. Curiosity is still going strong nine years in. 
The microphone would pick up sounds to be sent back to Earth with a few days delay. The sounds would also be used to accompany videos taken during the landing, end quote. Mazelis' plans were approved by NASA in 2017, and since then he's been working on a number of other ideas, including a 360 camera in a spherical cage that would bounce along the surface of the moon before a spacecraft lands and sprays up a bunch of regolith to get a clearer shot of the surface. It's pretty awesome to see an outsider get to come in and have such a big impact. Although, as Jim Bell, a planetary scientist at Arizona State University who's been collaborating with Mazelis on the camera idea, said of Mazelis experiencing imposter syndrome, quote, I think he felt he was an outsider, like he wasn't worthy in some way. And I'm like, dude, you have to understand that we're making this stuff up as we go along. There's no book, no class you take on how to operate a rover, end quote. And I kind of love that. Like, yes, there are a ton of super smart people building on decades of work from other super smart people, but so much of it is also entirely new terrain, and the scientists there are just trying things until they work. And I think that's one of the most exciting parts about space exploration, is watching people work really hard towards a goal that's a little uncertain, and taking a path that's never before been tread. The wonder that both that work and certainly the discoveries can inspire in people is ultimately a big part of what convinced some of the folks in charge at NASA to move forward with adding the microphones. Yes, they have practical and scientific applications, but capturing the public's awe at hearing another world cannot be underestimated. That's the kind of thing that will inspire stories and imagery for decades to come. Not to mention, inspire a lot of really smart and talented people to pursue their own interplanetary ambitions. For as long as the internet has been around, there have been people trying to dictate how people should behave on the internet. There's community-sourced guidelines and moderation to actual terms of service and organizations trying to get larger internet citizen agreements adopted en masse. But according to Wired's Adrian So, maybe we should just turn to actual 19th century etiquette books. Like the rest of us, So knows that the social media landscape right now is truly more of a hellscape. She also makes the argument, however, that lockdown is making it worse, and not just because more of us are online more than ever, but because we're less offline. Have you noticed yourself or people in your life getting a bit more socially awkward as the months go on? You know, a lot of us are getting worse at small talk on the rare occasions it's still necessary, and generally fumbling around in social situations we used to glide through on autopilot. In some ways, that's translating online, too. We've all been in our own physical echo chambers as well as our algorithmically ordained digital ones for almost a year now. Whereas you used to break that vacuum by going to hang out with a friend who could tell you to stop paying attention to the weird niche argument you were glued to on Twitter, now you just stay there, going ever deeper and deeper in. So maybe it's time to take a step back and reassess some best practices for existing healthily online. And to do so, So proposes pulling some tips from Arthur Martin's Handbook to Etiquette and Guide to True Politeness, a 19th century etiquette book that So says is just as applicable and sharp-witted now as it was when it was published. So also does acknowledge, quote, Etiquette has long been used as a tool to enforce gender-based and racial hierarchies. You don't have to admit to being racist if you can say you don't like someone for being loud or aggressive. You don't have to admit to being sexist if you can say you just didn't hire a woman because she wore inappropriate clothing. But even as we commenced tearing down the social norms that worked against us, we forgot that we do need at least a few guardrails. And nowhere is this more clear than on the internet, where tempers flare high, reading comprehension is low, and an experiment with an air fryer and a hot dog can turn into fiery discourse that lasts days. End quote. So with that in mind, here are a few takeaways from the book as well as So's modern social media spin on them. Quote, We can always be ordinarily civil, even if we cannot always be wise. 
Martine sensibly states at the start. In today's terms, we can take that to mean the internet is big and you're probably not the smartest person on it. Being kind is easier and pays more dividends than trying to dazzle a bunch of unimpressed strangers with your wit. In mixed company, be readier to hear than speak. There are a lot of people on the internet of all different shapes, colors, sexual orientations, genders, jobs, backgrounds, and ages. Assuming that your experiences are universal could backfire on you. Never argue with anyone but men of sense. You can happily ignore, block, or mute any bad faith arguments, arguments without evidence, and everyone who demands that you respond to their claims that you are dumb, unloved, and ugly. If you are nettled or stung, take care to never show it, or else it provokes more. As he memorably puts, the best way to not be hit by arrows is to not turn yourself into a target. This is the conventional rule of how to deal with internet trolls. End quote. And one final analysis of Martine's wisdom from So, quote, People will always respond if you care more about them than what they think of you. And that saying something genuine is always preferable to saying something overly clever, planned, or strained. End quote. I think I can get behind most of these. And even if your response to the endearing negativity of social media is to turn it off altogether, a decision I can definitely get behind, these are probably good pieces of advice to bear in mind for meat world interactions too, especially as we look forward to more of those coming back in the months ahead. Ending today with a simple but wonderful site recommendation. It's called 10 Years Ago and was built and recently revived by Neil Agarwal. And it is exactly what's on the tin. Go to the site and you'll be presented with buttons for a number of popular websites and clicking on those will take you to archived versions of exactly what the sites looked like 10 years ago today. You can choose from news sites like CNN and the BBC, as well as social sites like Reddit, YouTube, and Goodreads. There's also Amazon and Apple, which are kind of fun to see the products they were hawking on this day 10 years ago. The graphic design on Apple's iPhone 4 homepage like seriously awakened some visceral nostalgia in me. Now, all of the sites are powered via the Internet Archive, so of course, if you wanted to explore other dates and time, you could do that. But there's something nice about going exactly 10 years into the past. I especially like checking in each day and seeing which YouTube creators were on the homepage that day and what discussions people were having on Reddit, a site which, unique to the others on this list, looks almost identical to what it does now. Notably, the top recommended video on YouTube on February 18th, 2011, at least through this portal, was called How to Make Methamphetamine. And the video of a white dude in a tall tee smoking a cigarette while explaining the chemistry behind making meth is shockingly still up and available on YouTube today. Amazing. The site is also fun because it's interesting being reminded of the minor headlines of the day from the media outlets. You know, in so many ways, to me, 2011 doesn't really feel like that long ago. But I think the design of the websites can make it feel like it was longer ago than the contents of them would perhaps make it seem. I think I've mentioned it before, but relatedly, there's a hit-or-miss subreddit called Stuck 10 Years Behind, in which people are only allowed to post as if it's 10 years ago from the day. Kind of a similar vibe with a little bit more community interaction involved. The nostalgia is getting stronger the longer we're in lockdown. I wonder what Arthur Martin would say about that. I'll have to consult his book for proper expressions of nostalgia in polite company. Well, that is it for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotke.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I'm going to go start a Mars Core band using samples we get back from Perseverance. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. 